Today we talk about a couple of deaths that happen in one of the caves that we actually want to go diving in. Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. And today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to react to a video from Mr. Ballin or Mr. B. Cool. Allen, depending on how you want to call it. And by the way, there's, there's been a lot of controversy about the way we set Mr. B. Allen on the last video. So People are calling us idiots. People are saying, have some respect. Right. Right. Um, and ignoring the fact that we actually know John, we, you know, we communicate with them. We're yeah. actually planning on uh, doing a collaboration with Mr. Ballin. And, um, you know, his name is John B. Allen. That's why we call him Mr. B. Allen. And that's the way it was supposed to be. As a matter of fact, let's insert the video. Yeah, right away. So we can save on the comment. There's a video interview with him where yeah, he... Let's, let's just... Let's check this out. I'm glad we had a chance to be able to pull the curtain back behind Mr. B. Allen on uh, on uh, the, uh, on social media and, yeah. and uh, shed a little light on on you know who the guy is that's putting out the these wild uh, mystery <laughs> stories. Well, thanks for having me on, man. Hey, uh, so where can guys find you and gals? Where can folks find you on uh, on the interweb? So you can find me on YouTube. So my channel is Mr. B. Allen. People call me Mr. Ballin, but it is Mr. B. Allen. You're probably one of the few people that know that. All right. Well, there you go. Now you have it. Mr. B. Allen. Exactly. But, you know, just to avoid any confrontation or mistakes, Mr. Ballin. Okay. Fine. Mr. Ballin. Fine. Mr. Ballin. He just got tired of correcting people and decided to but just go one is with okay it. with him. And right. All right, so oh, we're no. reviewing one of his videos, uh, one of the places that you shouldn't go and people went anyway, number six, I believe. Story number two was about Devil's Hole. Devil's Hole is a cave in the middle of the desert that today, at least, you cannot go diving in. Like, no matter how much you want to, no matter how much you want to do it. Why? You can do it. You can get a permit to go there. It's completely sealed for they it. By the state of Nevada? By the government, they closed it. But apparently when but this... I, all right. No, when this happened, it wasn't sealed yet. I, maybe because of what happened in the video, they sealed it. But yeah, I mean, I, I would love to absolutely go there. So and if, we, if we sent in like an application, Dear Nevada. Dear Nevada. This yeah. is, you know, Dive Talk, Woody, I want to promote your hole. I mean, well, let us... That's, they probably I'd, will not... And that we sounds, want to get to new depths of, in the hole that have never been explored. And that sounds, please let me promote your hole. This is incredible. Did you, what? Did you hear yourself like that? Yeah, I mean that. Sounds, what, that we're, I mean, we're going to promote you it. You can't tell people That's like I want to promote your hole and expect it, them to. Is it? It's a hole in the desert. It, I want to promote. Okay, that fine, but that I, sounds weird. I want to promote your hole. Please let us do that and we will be respectful and follow all your rules and we want to penetrate wow. what? as deep no, do not pin. that's i think that's right, a well, little that's a little too far i'm not i can't i want to i want to i want to promote this hole i want to get in this hole so bad. all right all right i'm all just right. saying that's, please let us that's let's get back to the video but maybe they're watching to, if no, there's any not. way we could, it they already one. turn off when you said I want to promote your hole. That's they. I don't understand. They, get, they but, exited the video. Anyway, the point is positive. This thing, is actually this is actually a national park, so I think it's the federal government. So yeah, go okay. ahead and email the federal government, tell them you want to promote their hole, and see how that goes. But um, this will be once again a story Reasonable. of divers that went diving in Devil's Hole. Okay. Which I would die like I would love to go dive, you know, diving there. Yeah. But uh, they actually went to dive. It was a long time ago. No cave diving experience. Well, let's see how it uh, worked, how it okay. ended up. For so this was, but wait, this was before any permitting, or did they sneak before in? any permitting? Gotcha. Yeah. On the evening of June twentieth, nineteen sixty-five, four high school friends set off for a remote desert location about ninety miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada, that was within the very famous Death Valley. They arrived at their destination, which, if you didn't know any better, would just look like the middle of nowhere in the desert. But to them, they knew exactly where they were, and so they parked their car, they got out, and they began unloading very heavy underwater diving equipment and began walking it up a nearby hill. The group was made up of 19-year-old Paul Gian Contieri, his brother-in-law, 20-year-old David Rose, 19-year-old Bill Alter, and his younger brother Jack, who was 16 years old. Wow. As these four boys walked their diving equipment up this hill, they were hit with sign after sign after sign that was telling them, do not go any farther, 
turn around. They made it to the top of the hill and they were met with a huge fence, which once again said, do not go any farther. Without any hesitation, they went right under the fence and began walking down the other side, which was a very steep 30 foot rocky slope that led down to this very narrow strip of water that was the entrance to a very famous underwater cave called the Devil's Hole. Their plan was to dive all the way down to the bottom of the cave, which was at 325 feet. So they get down to the bottom of the hill and they begin putting on their scuba gear and Jack, the youngest, he's like, you know what guys, I'm having second thoughts. I don't want to do this anymore. Smart. I just wonder like what mindset do you have to be on? Like, and I don't know if they knew. I mean, if that, if that was their plan to go all the way to the bottom, that means they knew that that was the bottom. But what's your mindset of being like, I'm just a regular scuba diver. Uh, and again, this was in 1965. So this was a long, 50 years ago, 50, well, 56 years ago. Um, how, what's your mindset to be like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to give this a shot. Hmm. And with this shoddy gear, because the gear in 65 wasn't the best. Huh. I, like, I don't, did, were there lights even? Like, I don't, they would explode. Yeah. But once you got to 300 feet, it just, like, it just, and they were kids. Like, what's the mindset? Yeah. Well, a couple things. Um, I was going to stop it here as well. Number mm. one, they didn't know, and I've said this in videos before, they don't know what they don't know. Mm. They don't know what it, what needs there are for technical diving. Right. How technical is this? This is going into a cave down to depths that you're going to be severely narked, right. where you have big time gas needs. There's no lines. There's no proper lights. You're talking about complete unknown. I don't know if it's complex. I don't know if I'm going to turn around and get lost. So they were really just out there and they didn't know. Right. I mean, you know, go down to 325 feet. You know how badly narked you would be? The second thing I want to say is, you know, I was sitting there listening to Mr. Ballin talk. He's so, I can visualize just by the way he describes things. You can almost close your eyes and listen to him and visualize this situation yeah he does a really good job of just Best story verbally time. describing exactly what's going on that's what my one of my reactions was smart, about to be smart this guy jack to say you know what the 16 year old well, what's let's the wisest yeah let's do hear what happens yeah like i think hey, suit yourself and so jack volunteers himself to sit on the outside and be their lookout the other three paul david and bill they're totally still doing this dive and so they put on the rest of their equipment. They hop in the very warm water. It stays at about 92 degrees Fahrenheit year round Perfect. inside the devil's hole. They check their flashlights a couple of times. And when they're ready, they signal to each other and they begin their descent down into the dark abyss that is the devil's hole. So for the next couple of hours, Jack just sat on the surface waiting for his brother and his two friends to return. And just after midnight, David and Bill did return, but Paul didn't. And so when David and Bill got to the surface, they asked Jack, hey, have you seen Paul? Because we got separated on the way up and we, we figured he was already up here. And Jack said, no, it's just you two. I, I haven't seen Paul. And so David and Bill look at each other and they know they have a problem. Uh -oh. And they're like, we got to go back down. And so they put the regulators back in and they turn and start swimming down. Bill would say when they went back down to look for Paul, Dave was leading and Dave was going really fast to the point where Bill couldn't keep up with him. And you got to remember, it's pitch black down there and Bill's got his flashlight. That's the only way he can see Dave. And I, I'm going to pause it. Remember, it was at midnight. So not only is a cave, but it's at midnight. Yeah. And what I was thinking also, for those of you who are divers, I can't help but think this out. I don't know what depth they originally went to and then came back up, but it would probably was pretty deep. And they didn't have dive computers. I want everybody to keep this in mind. They were or using, SPGs, I think. They were using the they old mean. Navy tables, which yeah. ended up much later in the 70s, again in the 80s, being revised yeah. because of how severely bent people were getting. So they were just sitting around timing, and then they would time underwater how long they have at those depths. Were they making deco stops? Man. They, I'm surprised any of them survived. Well, actually, before you start again, it's interesting because when we read, when we react to these videos and these accidents, a lot of them happen a long time ago. Like diving yeah. has gotten so much safer with computers and reliable gear and lights that you can take down to 800 feet or whatever. Um, you know, diving is such a safe sport now because of the things that we learn 
from accidents like this one. So a lot of people watch this and it's like, oh, diving is so dangerous, but pay attention to it because most of these accidents are like back in the 80s, yeah. you know, this happened back in the 60s. Like, yeah, but now in the 2020s or whatever, whenever you're watching this, um, it's much safer and it will only get safer. Yeah, and, and you know, these are not real pictures. Their gear did not look like this. This right. is him. Nobody was trying, diving side mount. Yeah, he's just trying to give a... a Frog uh, kicking and side mount. He's trying to give a <laughs> visual here. And Dave was creating separation and getting farther and farther away. Bill had no way to stop him. And at some point, he lost him. Dave was just gone. And so Bill, not wanting to turn this into an even bigger problem, stopped where he was and went back to the surface. And he and his brother Jack just sit there anxiously waiting for Dave and Paul to return but they don't. And so at some point, Jack went and got authorities. When the police got the report about the two missing divers inside of Devil's Hole, I'm sure on some level they were like, that's why the signs are there. Yeah. You're not allowed to dive in there. But they put that you. aside and instead they contacted a guy named Jim Hoots, who was a professional diver who regularly dove inside of Devil's Hole. So he's very familiar with it. And they got him on scene within a couple hours to go looking for these guys. And originally, the hope was Paul and David had found their way into a section of Devil's Hole called Brown's Room, mm -hmm. which was this big air pocket that perhaps in an emergency situation, they had found their way in there and now they're trapped. So Jim and his dive partner get to the edge of Devil's Hole. They put on their gear, they hop in the water and they begin their descent. And it's totally dark. They got their lights and they go down about 90 feet to where the tunnel basically funnels down to a point. And through this point, you have to wriggle through and push through. Once you get through that, you enter into this massive chasm that if you shine your light in any direction, the walls are so far away that initially it looks like you're shining a light into infinity. It's this massive, massive space. By the way, that's how Eagle's Nest is. When you're at Eagle's Nest, right on the, you know, at the cavern, they're called cavern, but is, I mean, well, <clears throat> it's a stretch. Um, it's like that. It's so big that your light doesn't hit the walls. How about that? These guys could just go diving there. We just described how hard, if not impossible, it is to get a permit to dive there now. And a lot of it you'll learn later is because they're trying to protect a very rare species that only exists in this, this cave. cave system. And there's only like 300 of these pupfish in the world. Yep. So Jonathan Bird did a special on that. But yep. for them to get to Brown's room, the first place they're going to look for these guys, they needed to push through that little funnel and then immediately turn left and track the ceiling until they find a tunnel that goes back up again. And that is the tunnel that's very claustrophobia inducing. It's very tight that if you take it 90 feet back up, you get to Brown's room and that's that big air pocket. And so Jim and his dive partner, they make their way up this tunnel, they get to the air pocket and there's no divers. And so they go back down through the tunnel, back into that huge chasm. And instead of going back to the surface, they knew that if they didn't find them in the air pocket, they were gonna go down a little ways and see if they could find them on this one area called the lower ledge. And so the lower ledge was just a rocky outcropping that was about halfway down to the bottom of the cave. It was a natural break point before you went to the bottom. And so as they're descending in this infinity chasm, Jim is shining his flashlight in every direction looking for signs of these guys. And at some point his light picks up a reflection on the lower ledge. And so they get down to the lower ledge and that reflection was from a dive mask, the, the glass of the dive mask. It was sitting right on the lower ledge. Wow. And next to it was a single dive fin. So Jim and his dive partner, they pick yeah. these items up, they go back up to the surface and they confirm with Jack and Bill Alter that yes, that mask and that fin belong to Dave and Paul. And then afterwards they say to the search party, look, we were in Brown's room and they weren't in there. And so there's nowhere else they could be alive. And by now they've run out of air. Now, you would figure that if they found the mask and a fin, right, my mind would say they must be right near that area. That may be your first thought as well. But that's not necessarily the case when you're in a cave system like this that has severe flow, especially if that flow is going up and out or sometimes down. That could shoot a piece of gear yeah. very far from where that diver's body actually is. So just because they found that doesn't mean in a cave system that the body is anywhere near that gear. But my first thought and reaction was, oh man, they found the mask and the fin. The body's got to be, I don't know, nearby. Not necessarily the case. 
And so that mixed with the fact that we're finding our equipment strewn about the chasm, it's safe to say they're more than likely deceased. Jim and his dive partner said, look, we'd like to go back in and go all the way to the bottom. We stopped at the lower ledge, so we don't know what's down there. We anticipate we'll be able to find their bodies and we can at least confirm they're down there and then shift to a body retrieval mission. So Jim and his dive partner get back in the water. They go down the 90 feet to that little section you have to wriggle through to get into the chasm. Once they're inside, they keep going down, they pass the lower ledge, and they go all the way down to 325 feet. Now this wow. cave is huge, and the floor bottom is huge, but it's not so huge that you wouldn't be able to spot two bodies that have just recently landed down here. Is it safe to say that back when they went down there in the 1960s to 325 feet, they were on regular air? I guess so. I mean, the nitrox wasn't a thing <laughs> until like the, what, the 80s or uh, 90s? I'm thinking about helium. Yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't. Nitrox, so. which is not even helium, yeah, wasn't I, a thing until like the '80s or '90s. Okay, and that's why I said, "Is it safe to say?" Because I want to set up that when they were down there at 325 feet on regular air, yep. you're out of your mind. Like Deep you're air. out of your mind in terms of that's how narked you must be. Yeah, Woo, I would. You're you're totally in possible yeah. confusion mode. And so Jim and his partner are scanning their light across the bottom, which is relatively flat. You can see pretty far because of how clear the water is and they're not seeing anything on the bottom. They're looking all over the place and there's no bodies, there's no equipment, there's nothing. And they're thinking, how are we missing this? How are we not able to see this? And it was at this point that Jim noticed a little hole in the bottom of the cave floor, hmm. barely big enough for a full-size person with tanks to fit through that he hadn't seen before. And so they make their way over to it and Jim says, right when he was on the edge, he felt a fairly strong current being pulled past his legs down into this hole. Wow. It was almost like this was a drain on a bathtub and someone had pulled the plug and now all the water is draining into this little hole. And so Jim and his dive buddy kind of push themselves back to make sure they don't get sucked in. And Jim pulls out a weighted piece of string that goes out to 932 feet. And he would use this if there was ever a tunnel that he wanted to go down and he wanted to size up how deep it was. He would extend the line and he would let it fall until it hit something and then he would stop it and on the line were marks of how deep it was. And so he let this line go inside of this hole and it went all the way down to 932 feet without touching any surface, meaning it's at wow. least 932 feet deep from that point down. So Jim just... And it's important, I think, to, to just go a little bit into Devil's Hole is that till this date, they still don't know how deep it is. Mm. So back in the 60s or whatever, obviously, they didn't find the bottom and we still have no idea. And they're not going to give anybody a permit to go that deep. That's right. Not only do you have to get a permit to dive there, which is like going to be less than less numbers than we put a people on the moon. Yeah. Then the permit goes further and says, we're only giving you a permit to go to a certain depth. And there's no way we know that they will not give a permit to go that deep. Second thing I was going to bring up is that that suction hole is a siphon. That's yeah. known as a siphon. Those are extremely dangerous to dive in because you can't get back out. Yep. You can't get out and of people, those People have asked us, it's like, why don't you guys dive siphons? You've said it multiple yeah. times. You can't dive siphons. It's because if you have a problem, the last thing you want is for the cave to be trying to swallow you in and keep you in, right? When you have a problem, you just want to get out. So springs, which is what we dive, are a lot better because even if you're like, let's say injured or something happened and you can only dive, you can only swim like 10% of your speed, the cave is still trying to push you out. The spring is just pushing you out like a river. So you're getting out without even having to kick or work hard. So that's, right. that's what we want. Pulls his line back up and he looks at his dive partner and he's like, yeah, no, we're not going down there. Not only were they not equipped to go that deep, they also both knew if we go in this hole, there's a good chance we won't be able to get back out again because yeah. the current is so strong. So Jim and his dive partner go back to the surface and they say, look, we couldn't find their bodies. But what we think happened is they developed nitrogen narcosis mm -hmm. where you're in this sort of drunken state. You don't really know what's going on around you. And that suction slowly pulled them into this hole and they weren't really aware of their surroundings and they didn't stop themselves before they got pulled in and then it was too late and they were pulled down into oblivion. To this day, they've never found their bodies and scientists still don't know how deep that hole is. But in 2012, there was an earthquake in Mexico, so 2,000 miles away from Devil's Hole, that caused a tsunami to come through Devil's Hole. I don't know how that actually works, but 
the scientists say that's what happened. And so scientists believe that hole leads to an underground ocean wow. that connects to other parts of the world as far away as 2,000 miles. That's pretty awesome. 2,000. Huh? That <clears throat> hole possibly has a 2,000 mile long water connection. And that may explain why their equipment got shot back up out of a siphon, right? Because a I mean, before it's sucking down. So why would the mask and the fin end up going up? But it could change. Yeah, it I mean, necessarily uh, say a siphon. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I obviously I think they, in a narc induced stupor, they probably lost Maybe. gear or whatever. Maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how strong it is the siphon that it can suck people from 150 feet down to 300 and through a Wait little up. hole. But uh, yeah, I mean, when you're narc. But it's just more fascinating. That there is underwater two oceans, thousand mile long underwater oceans under the desert. And by the way, you know there's more of these. This is just one of the holes that they happen to dive in and find in the deserts of the world. This, guy, this planet is amazing. Yep. Today, diving is still strictly forbidden inside of Devil's Hole unless you're a scientist, and they stay far away from that hole at the bottom. All right. So that's the end of the video. Um. I mean, I feel like I should go get a PhD just so I can go dive in this thing. Like, I want to nice. dive a devil's hole so bad. But uh, he did say something at the end that is true. That is that you can get a permit to dive at this place. Um, and, and like you said, there's been more, more people on the moon that actually are allowed to go into the cave at devil's hole. So you got to be somebody incredibly special. Oh, my God. For the few people that have been allowed to dive in that hole, wow. I mean, that would be somebody pretty incredible. And the funny thing is that we actually know multiple people know. that have dived at Devil's Hole. I know. Awesome. Um, Brian Kaycock, your cave diving instructor, has been at Devil's Hole. And, in fact, wants to get a permit to go to 600 feet. Right. And Mike Young, who we've had on the show, has been at Devil's Hole. And they were there because they were part of Engine Caves, the movie about cave diving. And obviously, Devil's Hole being such an amazing cave was featured on the film. And the two of them got to go there. And Brian Keiko, actually, you can see him on the movie. He gets a sample of water from 300 feet. And right? that part of the movie is about five minutes long segment. To yep. film in that Devil's Hole. I think it would be interesting to know what did it take to film five minutes of footage? What does <laughs> it really take to be able to do that? Yeah, so we actually reached out to these guys and we told them to uh, join us on a quick Zoom call so we can talk about Devil's Hole, the whole cave, how the process was to film it, and um, you know, do they want to even go back? Because I want to go. Yeah, I want to go. And will they take us? Absolutely. We're dive talk and we want to explore that hole. That's what I'm saying. So check this out. In joining us on the show today, we have two people that have actually been at Devil's Hole. Jonathan Bird, welcome to the show. Mike Young, welcome to the show. Yes. Hello. Hey, guys. Love to have you guys here because um, I think there have been more people on the moon that actually dove at Devil's Hole. So we're Super, super happy and excited that really? you guys are here. Yes. Why? I want to. Let's. I want to dive there. Well, look, how about you guys tell us? Can I dive there with you guys? All right. Or together yeah. or what? What's the big <laughs> deal? It's, what do you think? Jonathan. Well, Jonathan, you probably know more about the permit application. Uh, <laughs> so there's there are two devil's holes. Uh, this is one thing that's a little bit confusing. So when you just look on Google Maps, where's Google? Where's Devil's Hole? You drive over there and there's a little sign that says, hey, you're at Devil's Hole. If you walk in the road um, off the, the dirt road, you'll come to a big chain link fence around a little tiny hole in the ground and you can see some water in that hole. And that's the Devil's Hole where the pup fish are. Okay. And so that is a little hole that leads into a, a submerged cave system. And it's, believe it or not, it's one of the largest aquifers in the United States, uh, directly under 
uh, the desert. It's crazy. So, you know, Death Valley. Um, but if you walk about 600 feet down the path up, up a hill, you'll come to another sort of like a cage that's over another hole in the ground. And it's, it's way up at a higher elevation and you can't see any water in it. But if you have permission and you can go in that cave and you repel down into that hole, awesome. you will enter a cave and then you will go through some restrictions and you'll crawl on your hands and knees and there's some, some bugs and, you know, all kinds of weird stuff. And then you'll finally get down to the water when you get down to the same level that the other one's at. So they're about 600 feet apart, but they're different. So the one with the pup fish, they call Devil's Hole. And the one up the hill, um, they call Devil's Hole Cave or Devil's Hole 2, depending on who you ask. Um, and so people tend to refer to them as the same place, but they're actually different. So the one where the pup fish live, the Park Service kind of goes in there regularly to count the pup fish because they're one of the most endangered animals on planet Earth. And wow. so... Their, their population is in the hundreds, not the thousands. Uh, it's the only place they're found. They're just like, it looks like a guppy. Like it's just a little fish. Um, uh, but they have evolved in that one place and they exist nowhere else in the world. Wow. So, but there is a cave system under there. And that is the cave. I believe that is the cave where the people that you're talking about in this video drowned. It's the cave that's really easy to get into because you can literally, if there wasn't a fence around it, you could just put on your bathing suit and walk into the water. Um, the yeah. other one requires climbing gear to get down into it. Um, you'll have to rappel down about 50 feet just to get into the first section of cave. And then there's no other way out except to basically climb back up the rope you rappelled down. Okay. So it's, it's a lot, the access is a lot more difficult. Um, you would think that because they're only 600 feet apart, those two cave systems would join underwater. Um, but in fact, nobody has found a connection between them yet. It's hmm. sort of like they're in parallel cracks that, you hmm. know, the, there's no question that the water intermingles, but nobody's found a passage between those, those right. two cracks that a, a person can get through. That being said, when we went into Devil's Hole Cave for filming ancient caves, um, they told us, the Park Service told us that more people had walked on the moon than had been diving in Devil's Hole Cave. Wow. But we had a four-person film crew, so we might be winning now. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> I think we might be up one on them. So, yeah, and, and there's a lot to unpack. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, Jonathan Bird, if you are not, Subscribe to Jonathan Burr's Blue World, which I hope you are. Every single one of our subscribers should be subscribed there. Um, you have a great episode on the Devil's Hole 1 or whatever, where the pup fish are. That's how I actually learned about Devil's Hole a long time ago. And I was like, immediately, like, whatever amount of money it costs to get a permit, like, let's let's get it. And then I realized that it was basically impossible uh, yeah. to, to get it there. So when I saw that you guys went there in ancient caves, I was freaking out. I'm yeah. like. How did they get a permit? Well, because I want to talk it's, about it's, it's hard. Yeah. And so it's hard to get a permit. That's obvious. But Mike, you were explaining to me off camera. Once you get a permit, what are the requirements to even get your gear in there? What did they put you through in terms of <laughs> sterilization and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, we had to sterilize all of our equipment. We had to boil it in water at like 130 degrees for an hour. We had to keep it all dry for 30 days. Uh, we had everything had to go through steramine. Uh, and then and we had to document and prove to them that this had been done. So Every piece of equipment, all of our climbing gear, all of our tanks, our regulators, wow. every piece of equipment. Wow. So then once you were in there and you're diving in, in this thing, are they watching? Are they examining? Are they every day rechecking the gear? Like how, what? Well, once the gear been cleared to go in, they didn't check anymore, uh, okay. but they checked it at the beginning. Uh, and yes, they're watching. They have cameras everywhere and they're, okay. and they're constantly monitoring. Um, and, and, and they knew things before we did sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So did anything happen during it where they were like, hey, guys, 
uh, we saw this. We'd rather you not do that tomorrow or please be careful with this. Like, were there conversations? Well, I think we were ahead of schedule one day once on, on one of the dives and, and we started carrying some equipment in and like 10 minutes they were, they were there and they're like, wait, that's not on today's schedule. That's for tomorrow, you know? And it was like, wow. okay, okay. Well, we're, we're just yeah. a little ahead of schedule. <laughs> wow. We, it's that we, strict. We forgot to check in one morning. You know, you're supposed to check in with the Rangers before you go on site. And, you know, we just, we, they knew we were going to be there the whole week. And so like by the third day, I was just like, I just kind of like assumed like, they know we're going to be there. Like, you know, we, we, we went over there and they saw us on the camera and we hadn't checked in at the office and they sent a Ranger over to yell at us. They were very nice. They were just like, no, 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 you got to check in every morning. We're like, okay, sorry. Okay, but um, also the permits that you guys get are limited, right, to a depth. Like you can now go further than this or like what, what kind of limits do they put on the permits? Hmm. So the, per the interesting thing about the permit is we actually didn't get a permit. Um, we were allowed to piggyback onto um, the science team's permit hmm. because basically there was a science team there that was doing work in the cave, in the dry part of the cave. And they had asked um, the Park Service if we could help them with some of their research by getting them some water samples and some deep water samples. And they allowed us to be put onto their permit. So I couldn't even tell you how hard it is to get a permit because, you know, we piggybacked. Uh, gotcha. But um, there, there was they normally have, um, I think you know, like a hundred foot limit or something on the diving. Um, and they made an exception for us because um, Gina's team, the science team that we were working with, they were looking for a 300 foot water sample. And so we got a special permit for Brian to go uh, to 300 feet for that water sample. Wow. So, so describe like, the environment is, you know, the temperature outside and is it like the Sahara desert where there's sand blowing all over the place on your gear. And then all of a sudden you get into water and then what's that water temperature and how long did it take to lower all that gear down and actually get into the cave? Like describe, is it an hour? Is it four hours? Just You know, I turned my back and Mike did all the work <laughs> and then then it was Whatever. all done. And I was like, how did he do that so fast? So I think Mike should answer this one. Yeah, it's interesting. So I want to hear about it. Yeah, it, it is in the in the edge of Death Valley. So out on the surface, it's, you know, a desert, uh, you know, cactus, uh, you know. Uh, but once you go down into the cave, it's like most caves, you know, it's a it's a constant temperature, uh, constant humidity. But the interesting thing was the water temperature was about 92 degrees. Mm, nice. And we were actually worried about the rebreathers getting too hot because the scrubber produces heat. And, uh, and so we ran some tests in, in the lab, you know, and it was like at, when 92 degree water, the breathing gas was like 118 degrees being produced by the wow. scrubber. Wow. And we were really Concerned with that, and so we actually developed some cooling units to go in the loop to cool wow. the air down before we breathe it. But the battery packs were pretty big, and and Brian was having trouble with you know getting trimmed out with all these big batteries and stuff. And so, so we ended up diving without the coolers, but we just had to keep our workload so low hmm. that that we weren't producing a lot of CO two or, or heat. Yes, and what was the temperature outside the air temp just to? For perspective oh. on this about you know we, we were there in the winter time um oh, okay. and so it wasn't really that hot and in fact in the evenings by the time the sun got went down and we were pulling gear out it was cold and it was windy and the whole topside team was hiding behind a rock and i remember coming you know you'd come up out of the hole and it was so warm down there it was down it was humid and in the 90s and you'd come out and pop up into the air and the wind is blowing and it's like 50 and it was freezing <laughs> yeah so were you guys able to leave stuff down there since you were there for a week like did you leave gear yes. in the cave okay because yeah. man pulling that down and up every day must be yeah because to get the initial getting the gear in initially um was I don't know, probably four to five hours. There you go. Um, That's what I was. Okay. And then we added filming on top of that. And so we were filming, taking the gear in. So, you know, you had to stop, wait, okay, we, we didn't get that good. Let's try that again. Uh, you know, so, but, um, and then each day we would just take out what we needed to refill and then, and then, 
and then carry that back in the next day. So the in between wasn't too bad. And then pulling all the gear was another four to five hours, probably. So I heard, long, oh, I was just going to say, I heard that you had some issues with the camera, too, right, Jonathan? Like once everything was down and everybody was ready to go, the camera wouldn't turn on or something. Did I hear that we, right? We did. have we, Yeah, we did have one uh, one dive where the, the uh, camera was acting up. You know, these things happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what's interesting, though, Jonathan, I'm trying to put perspective. I'm getting to my point. How much footage in terms of time ultimately was there compared to the overall amount of time and logistics that it took to get this done so those two questions just well, tell people what it really takes to do this i mean not not as much as you would have thought we didn't we didn't leave a whole lot on the cutting room floor um one of the things that was sort of a challenge about this is that we were only given a couple of days we could dive we had a window for the permit for the diving and just logistically, it was not likely that we were going to get more than two dives a day. Um, Todd and I, basically the film crew was on open circuit. So Mike and Brian were on rebreathers. They could dive all day long, but, you know, we were there also to film what they were doing. Um, and so we were kind of limited. Um, so we really only had four days of diving and basically two dives a day. So we really only had, for, at least for the film crew, we only had eight dives. And you got to understand, this is eight dives in a cave that none of us has been in. Mm. And in fact, nobody that we know has been in. Right. And so we have no idea what we're going to expect when we get there. We have no idea. Are there right. lines? Are there guidelines mm -hmm. in the cave? Are they serviceable? Are they safe? So we don't know anything. I don't know anything about what this cave is going to look like. Is, are there going to be stalactites? Are there yeah. not going to be like, and so the first dive or two, we were just like kind of getting the lay of the land, you know, like what can we film? What's it going to look like? And of course, on top of this, Brian's got to plan a dive to 300 feet. So he and Mike were trying to get his, his dual rebreathers all, you know, worked out and figure out about the cooling unit and, you know, getting everything. And the other thing is like, it, there's very little space in this cave to work. You'll see in the video, like when you come down, it's, it's like a 45 degree angle coming down to the water. And then there's a tiny little bit of water and there's literally no flat place to put anything down. Wow. So we ran a rope kind of across that you could clip things to, but like at one point um, we dropped, we dropped one of our big blue dive lights. It was like one of those, 30 K ones. It was like this big oh. and it rolled into the water and it did not stop rolling until 150 feet. Oh. <laughs> so, so you Brian found, no, Mike found it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So Lucky basically four, on. <laughs> so four, four days, pretty much all day to get ultimately how much time in footage. Well, in the minutes. film, it's about, in the film, it's about a five-minute sequence. Five minutes. Um, yeah. That's what it takes. That's the level that Jonathan Gord's Blue World does. Yeah. To get but, five but minutes Jonathan of that. So, But Jonathan was so organized. He had such a good shot list that, I mean, his, the efficiency of the filming was phenomenal. You know, a lot of, a lot of times a film will do like a 20 to one ratio you put in 20 hours for one hour of film you know and and jonathan had to do it in like four hours like a four to one ratio yeah but the point is That's like awesome. gus and i you know we went down we cut some lines we did a you know we did a thing on that or whatever you know that was nice afternoon this is a whole nother level to get five minutes but when you watch your stuff no wonder oh, you can tell right it's unbelievably mad it's the best in the world yeah i don't think anybody has as good a quality and, but that's what it takes. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to do this interview with you guys personally, but also talk about devil's hole, because I think it's interesting that it seems like nobody has found the bottom in this cave. Right. I mean, in the video that we mm -hmm. reacted to, they talk about how there's like a siphon or something yeah. and somebody dropped like a thousand foot line and he never hit the bottom, but nobody goes through that siphon, which is I'm guessing on the pop fish side, because that's where the, the people went missing. Um, right. They went all the way down to like, I think they said something like, I don't remember, like 200 feet or 300 feet, I think it was. And then there's a hole in the bottom and there's like water going into the hole, which I still don't understand how water is going in, but there's still the level stays the same. Maybe it's being fed from another side. Um, 
Yeah. But this guy dropped a line. He had 982 feet, I think, line. Dropped the line, and he never hit the bottom. So they were like, wow, I don't, I don't even know how big this cave is down there. And it goes 2,000 miles or something like this? Well, no. The, the, on the video, uh, he talked about that there was uh, an earthquake in Mexico 2,000 miles away, and it reversed the siphon to a, to a spring after yeah. that happened, and the water came out. Anyway. I don't know. It was, they said that there's like an underwater ocean that can, can connects thousands of miles, and nobody has ever been that deep inside well, that side of the cave it is the it is the one of the largest aquifers in the country so I, I don't know much more than that but i know that um sheck exley holds the record uh for the deepest dive there and i think it's four some 470 how, how much do you know mike what i i don't know but the the line only ran to about 260 so, so in any case, Sheck, Sheck was the deepest and Brian really wanted to beat it. And uh, <laughs> the Park Service would not give him a permit. Brian submitted a permit to go to 600. And the Park Service was like, uh, no, no way. So uh, Gina wanted a sample from 300. So that's how far they let him go. <laughs> and he's still working on that, right, Mike? He's still trying to get to 600? I'm, I, it's my understanding that Brian is still wanting to try to do that. Man, yeah, that would be amazing. Almost 200 meters down there. It would be cool. I mean, to, to see how far the cave goes and where do they connect? Because they like I like you said, 60 feet apart, they have to connect somewhere. Yeah, but they're not going to have they're not going to have enough time based on these restrictive permits to really be able to explore enough to figure all that out. I don't think they want that to happen, it sounds like. And this is controlled by the state, right? It's a state now of a state park, not a federal park. Uh, no, it's a national park. It's, oh, it's a national park. Yeah, it's a national park. Okay, so the federal government is controlling this? Yeah, <laughs> and, and it was super frustrating because, you know, we wanted to shoot some aerials with our drone. And the people at the, the park service were perfectly fine with it. They're like, yeah, I mean, it's a desert. We don't care if you fly your drone. But <laughs> you the, federal, the federal park rules are that you can't. Yeah. And so they're like, you can't. So, you know, for the aerial establishing shot that we have in the film, we had to go outside the National Park for that. Gotcha. Well, is there any plans, do you think, Jonathan, to go back there? Is there anything that you have a reason to want to go back there? Um, Asian Capes 2. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ancient <Dream>. Reckoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, for, for me, like... Uh, um, I don't have any like real strong need to go back. Um, no. uh, cause I'm not, I'm not a, I'm a filmmaker, not a, you know, not an explorer, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm not, I'm not the guy that wants to go to 600. I'm happy to let Brian go to 600. He can tell me all about it. Right. Um, but if there was another film project there, I'd love to go back. Yep. Interesting. Well, awesome. I think what this told everybody it certainly told me is that it's just tremendous technical ability and money and logistics to be able to have guys like you expose the world to places that you just said less humans have been to than possibly on the moon. And we appreciate it. And we want to, we wanted to expose you guys to the world more through dive talk to say, these are the guys that enable us to discover more of our own planet. And yeah. we're so jealous. And I wish I could do it with you, man. <laughs> I really, well, I, you know, I'll tell you what, it was, it was an interesting undertaking because the place is very remote and you wouldn't think, you know, it's in Nevada, it's in the U S but it's like, it's in the middle of nowhere. And like Mike came up with a whole, like his dive trailer, like he's got, mm -hmm. you know, oxygen and a compressor and scuba tank, like we had to basically bring an entire dive shop on location to do it. Amazing. We, we had to rent an RV because we had a film crew of 19. It was the largest crew that I've ever had to manage. Um, and they all got to go to the bathroom occasionally. Wow. You can't just yeah. all go behind a cactus. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so we had to rent an RV just to have like a bathroom on site, but it was also nice to get out of the wind. Um, so it was, it was, you know, it was a real undertaking. Wow. Well, that's thank you. Awesome. That's, that's amazing. That's for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Thank you guys for, for joining us. And once again, everyone 
Go and subscribe to Jonathan Burt's Blue World. Blue yeah. World Plus, too. I love Blue World Plus. It's like all the technical stuff that I want to know. All the stuff that I'm curious about. It's like, I wonder how they rigged this camera. Well, that's where you find that. That's cool. In Mike Young's channel. I mean, all the gnarliest cave diving ever. Uh, it's there with the <laughs> Roaring River uh, project you know, as well. Awesome stuff. Mike, Mike's channel is awesome because it terrifies me. Every, every <laughs> video he puts up is just like, what is he doing? Exactly. <laughs> the videos, I love the videos are titled like going from sump two to sump three. And I'm like, right. what? <laughs> why? <Right>. It looks <laughs> <Amazing>. horrible. <laughs> Thanks, anyway, guys. Yes. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Don't forget to subscribe also to this channel. And um, yeah, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody.